What's up, you sweaty nerds? It's 2016. I'm John Shep. You're watching Collider Heroes, episode 39 in the brand new year. I've got my guests here, Robert Meyer Burnett. Thanks for being on the show. How you doing? Good to be back. And Happy a New Year. And Amy Dallin. What's Hello. going on? Happy New Year. It's lovely to be back. It's great to have you both as a special guest to rock in the new year. We're going to start off just with an intro, listing off. We've got so many movies and television shows that are coming out just in 2016. I just want to list off the things that we're going to be talking about over the next year and sweating it out. It's crazy how many movies we've got just in movies alone. We've got Deadpool, Batman versus Superman, Dawn of Justice, Captain America, Civil War, X-Men Apocalypse, Suicide Squad, maybe Gambit and Doctor Strange all on the big screen. And then we've got The Flash, Agent Carter, Preacher, Arrow, Luke Cage, The Walking Dead, Gotham, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Lucifer, Daredevil, Legends of Tomorrow, and Supergirl all hitting the small screen. In Insanity. All right, so that's what's going on. Madness, I say. What a time to be a super nerd. It's it's now more than ever. I'm loving every minute of it. What do you guys think about 2016? I I can't imagine a better year. Plus, did you see that Hot Toys Deadpool figure? I did this morning. Come on, come on. I, you know, I mentioned it to you the first time. That that's the first toy. Of, a, of Hot Toys that I'm thinking of actually purchasing. And then I was like, no, nah, I'm not going to get it. But I thought about it for a long time this morning. I was like, holy crap, it's so poseable. And like you can make the dumbest poses with Deadpool. And all these this Deadpool marketing, which we'll talk about a little bit later, is so incredibly fun. It Plus, me I mean, maybe it, uh, you know, it's the second mutant Hot Toys figure after the four Wolverine figures they made. So maybe, maybe we'll be allowed to have more mutant Hot Toys figures. Perhaps. Because I'd like to rock a bishop. Hey, man. Oh, that'd be so... Which that version be, would you want? The original. Like, cool. I think the first version of Bishop, when he first... Like, when he was try, trying to fight Trevor Fitzroy. Remember that? <laughs> Trevor <laughs> Fitzroy? <laughs> I love, though, that X-Men era. It was crazy. I want a Colossus. Well, maybe with Deadpool. Yeah. If the Deadpool license is open. I think that would be cool. Uh, I think so, too. Colossus. Well, how about you, Amy? Lady Mutants. All the Lady Mutants. It's the, the women of the X-Men are the best characters. Aurora with the Mohawk my... would be incredible. Yeah. Barry Windsor Smith Aurora. Well, I want to get that Olivia Munn Psylocke. Isn't she? Is it, is it Olivia Munn? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you see that new costume picture she dropped on yes. her best of 2015 Instagram crazy. account? All right. <laughs> well, yeah, I'd like to. Th I'd also like to throw a special shout out to all of you fans and viewers who've been watching our show all of 2015. Thank you so much for the support. We're gonna rock it in 2016. We're gonna start it out by talking about the Doctor is in Doctor Strange the movie. Just released his first few incredible uh, picks a week ago on Entertainment Weekly. Uh, they dropped the first character picks of Benedict Cumberbatch as Doctor Strange, as well as stunning concept art of the astral travel and his sanctum sanctorum. We've seen the film that closely follows his origins of the comic, and Kevin Feige says they're going to keep that Steve Ditko look and the dimensional travel as well that goes in through the film. You got Cumberbatch mentioning how he himself actually uses meditation in his real life. You have Tilda Swinton. She's saying her character is pretty androgynous, the ancient one. You have Chiwetel Ejiofor saying Baron Mordu is both a hero and a villain. And then finally, you've got Mads Mikkelsen. He's set to play the main villain, but who is he going to be? Is he going to be Mephisto? Is he going to be Nightmare? Is he going to be Dormammu? I mean, let's just talk about Doctor Strange. That's coming out this year. Dude, I don't think you're as excited about anything as you are about Doctor Strange. I am Strange. very, it's my most Because you're one of the old school. Yeah. I mean, I think he looks, um, first of all, he looks amazing. You know, trusting Kevin Feige, once again, this movie looks like a home run. Uh, they're taking it now into the mystical realm, which mm -hmm. I didn't I didn't think they could do Asgard. <laughs> right. But they did. They did. A few you years know? ago, we were like, how are they going to pull off Thor? And no. now it's just like, Doctor Strange. It's unbelievable. And and that that side profile shot of Cumberbatch's Doctor Strange with the mm -hmm. high call, I'm like, how 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 do we live in a world where we're getting this kind of a thing? Right. I, I don't know. Even just visually, even the movie could be garbage, and then I would still love it because they visually it feels so flavory, and and they feels like they they were able to rip Steve Ditko out of the comic panel and throw it into real life. That's I mean, what, it feels what, like. what I, I I said this outside, but one thing I loved about these pictures immediately was just that this is the instant confirmation that we are not living in the timeline where we got the black leather jacket version of <laughs> Doctor Strange. That's Right. right. They've Who wants actually committed, and yes. it's amazing. But he can wear, maybe when he goes to the supermarket, he puts that jacket on. But yeah, on. fine. He can have regular clothes. But that's, that's fine. The, the but great thing about seeing these characters is 
they're not reimagining them. <laughs> they're going back to that classic look that we all grew up with. Salt and pepper. And, and the salt mm -hmm. and pepper hair, there's no, they're not reimagining, they didn't cast somebody who's like 20. Right. To be like young Doctor Strange. <laughs> right. I mean, Paul Hello, Rudd's like 40 he's plus, he's right. Ant-Man. I mean, you've really got to love what direction they're taking the Marvel Cinematic Universe because there has yet to be a, a misstep. No, that's very it's amazing. true. Let's go backwards. Like, uh, so Mads Mikkelsen, one of my favorite actors, oh. incredible. If you haven't seen Hannibal, just the guy is a, an insane actor. He's amazing. Um, he, the shift. He's able to yes, in, in Bond, he's able to bring this madness to and, and this delicate evil. I don't know what character he's going to play yet. I, I, I'm hoping it's Dormammu, but I would be happy if it was Mephisto, and I would even be okay with Nightmare. I mean, Nightmare is kind of a smaller character, but at the same time, he is the first villain that Doctor Strange fights in his very first, Doctor Strange's very first appearance. So I went back and looked and I was like, all right, I went through some pictures, <laughs> the old, you know, Steve Ditko, weird kind of elf looking Nightmare. Wow, you were getting super sweaty I was, I was like, movie. yeah, man, maybe he could be that character. He might work as a Mephisto type character, but honestly, I really want to see him play Dormammu. And it'd be cool just to see him with a flaming head, but still his regular face. I would love to see that, so. What do you guys think? What villain do you think he's going to play? I think it's Dormammu. Because that's that's the classic. I mean, it, it is Doctor Strange. Right. And and I think Kevin Feige knows. Like, he's, he's he, he probably sits around and, and I, I just imagine Kevin Feige surrounded by minions that just bring him, bring me Doctor Strange, like, one through, what was the first his Strange Adventure? Yeah, it's a Strange Tales. Strange like Tales. 124 me, or yeah, something. Yeah, Strange. And, and people just show up. Like they fan him <laughs> with those issues. And he just sits there drinking Mai Tais and looks back and goes, you know, I think Doctor Strange needs to look just like he did when we first saw him. And someone makes it happen. Yes, master. Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> Speaking I mean, of Dormammu, if they have Dormammu, that means the mindless ones are going to be busting <laughs> out. They're just these weird like rock-like creatures with oh, lasers coming out of their that's head. That's actually a really good argument for it being Dormammu because mindless ones does allow us to have a whole bunch of faceless bad guys we can punch. A horde I of creatures. I know people they, hate that they keep going And you know that, Feige it's loves really that. Effective. It's like they got to have that ending with a billion creatures that can be deactivated just with one them, squid. Yeah. It's like, if we could only stop this trans-dimensional portal that that's open to the mindless ones to New York. It's like, you see all these mindless ones causing destruction. Someone, ah, oh, there, I've done it. You know, they're Although all gone. Mephisto, instead of having aliens in the sky, maybe mm. you can go down to hell. Right, the you whole, know they're gonna the, have to get into that. They do have to get into that. Yeah. I mean, Thanos was in love with death, mm -hmm. after all. I mean, are they gonna, are we gonna be dealing with that? Is that what the Infinity War is gonna be about? Like Thor Ragnarok, is that gonna have he Hela, Queen of the Dead? Uh, the yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it's, it, I. No matter who loses, we win. That's right. No matter who wins, we we don't lose. <laughs> we are winning this entire year. There's no bad option I mean. in there. Yeah. And, and Chiwetel Ejiofor, I cannot wait to see how they portray Baron Mordu because it's like even from the original comics, like he was always kind of like, I right, why this guy should come in. He's shouldering in on my action with you know with the ancient one because he was gonna obviously you know use it to for evil. So I think in, in this version they're gonna keep him very kind of. Uh, Almost like the way they played Sinestro in Green Lantern is my mm. guess. Yeah, well, you know. But yeah, is he a hero and a villain, or is that what the villain wants us to think? Because that's how people talk. Right. <laughs> he was great in Serenity. He was great oh, yeah. in everything. He was an incredible, yeah. incredible as a villain. villain. Is that like the the assassin? Well, as this year progresses, we're going to have a lot more to talk about with Doctor Strange. So keep keep your uh, your uh, astral projector, uh, you know, void, whatever you want to call it, open. But oh, one he's last got the thing. eye. He's got the, he's eye, got the, the eye of Agamotto. Is that going to be coming into the the Infinity Gauntlet? Is the eye actually going to be the time gem? That's wow. my that's my guess because there's only two gems left, and it's the time gem and it's the soul gem. And I think you're going to find the soul gem. It's gonna. It's not gonna be in Thor Ragnarok. I think the Soul Gem is gonna be revealed in Guardians of the Galaxy two, and that's gonna be Warlock. So my guess is that Doctor Strange is gonna be the Time Gem, and that's time gonna gem? be that's the a Eye weird of Agamotto. Way to go, but yeah. is Kurt Russell playing an old Warlock? I uh, I certainly hope so. I that don't would know. be the coolest thing ever. It, it would be incredible. I mean, you know, Adam Warlock. Yeah, I I still think he's going to be like the astronaut, the yeah. advanced astro. Right, but, right. You know, a lot of people are like, he's not going to be that. I'm like, I don't know. He's supposed to be part alien. I don't know. <laughs> you know, this is also they they mix and match a lot of origins and like make it work so the that it's it's high impact fun 
when you're watching in a movie. It's not like 40 issues of a comic book where you're like, it's just different storytelling. So you have to remember they have to combine and change things. So. I just can't believe we're going to get Civil War and Doctor Strange in the same year. That's pretty insane. Make mine Marvel. That's right. Excelsior. <laughs> well, hang on one second. Make mine Batman and Daredevil. Ooh. Our next topic is Batman versus Daredevil. We've got a rumor going around that Daredevil season two is going to open on the exact. What do I say? Open. It's going to just drop on Netflix on the same day that Batman v Superman: <laughs> Dawn of Justice opens, March twenty fifth. So if it happens, what do you think? Is it going to affect the box office of Batman v Superman? Amy, what do you think? Daredevil I, dropping on Netflix. I don't think that would be likely to have a big box office effect because it's not difficult to plan a weekend that involves both going to see a movie and watching, a, binging something on Netflix. Yes, you're uh, correct. So I think they can happily coexist on a pretty rad weekend. How about you? I agree. I don't think it's going to affect it at all. People are going to go see Batman versus Superman. I mean, my my mom, my 76, mm -hmm. oops, sorry, mom, my 76-year-old <laughs> mother is like, you know, they're making a movie with Batman and Superman, and I, that sounds good to me. I'm like, Aww. my mom wants to see Batman versus Superman. My mom does not have Netflix. <laughs> she does not. She doesn't care about Daredevil. Right. She really doesn't. You know what I, I was going to say, all parents, I love this when parents try to tell, like I'm a giant nerd, but my dad sometimes, you hear about this uh, this Civil War film? It's like, yeah. <laughs> it's so cute though, they're I, trying. I know. I get a little irritated. It's like, yes, of course I've heard of this. But so it's, it's kind of like, cute because they want to, they're trying to bro yes. down with you. No, it's so you know, true. They're kind of, it, they're, 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 they're what on do you that. think this Wonder Woman's going to be, <laughs> Robert? You're like, mom, right? Mom, you were alive during World War I. <laughs> It's like, I no, told I you to never bring that up. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't think it's going to have it's going to have zero effect, in my opinion. I just think it's fun that the, the Netflix is like, oh, you're opening this film. That's, you know, basically your entire next like 13 or 14 films hinges on this one movie, Batman v Superman. Here, we're just going to throw our our Daredevil second season. Just we're going to drop that online, see what happens. It's one of like seven or eight other things we've been, you know, successful Which is, again, <laughs> trusting Kevin Feige because we're here now talking about the release date of the Daredevil Netflix season two. Right. With Punisher and Elektra. So it's like. And it's, we're doing it for free. It, totally. <laughs> yeah. Because we're crazy. Yeah. Well, no, because we're sweaty and excited about it. That's, I mean, I think we, we said this earlier on Movie Talk. It's like, look, you could see five episodes of Daredevil season two, then go see Batman v Superman, then come home and watch the other seven. <laughs> If you want to have or, a crazy weekend. Or you can go to the Thursday night preview screening of Batman v Superman right. and then come home and skip work on Friday and right. then binge watch it. And then see There'll Superman v Batman, Batman again. again on Saturday. <laughs> I mean, how great is it we're going to get Elektra and Wonder Woman in the same weekend? It's insanity. Uh, come on. But somebody it's else madness. That, like, uh, BBS has many sort of inspirational notes from Dark Knight Returns yep. and we're getting Daredevil Elektra in season two. So basically it's just Frank Miller weekend. It's You're right. Frank. It is <laughs> Frank <laughs> Miller weekend. weekend. She just coined it. That's there it is. Called in it. <laughs> Frank Miller weekend. That's what we call it now from City now Sunday on. Night yeah. and just scrub your brain so March 25th, Frank Miller weekend. What, hashtag what you Frank Miller weekend. Yeah, hashtag <laughs> Frank Miller weekend. What's happening? What parties are we going to go to? There has to be like Superman, Batman, Daredevil, Punisher, Wonder Woman. <laughs> Part of some insane viewing party. Everyone, I mean, see everyone. Well, my friends did yeah. a whole Daredevil marathon thing, so like there will be some planning issues with social right. circles. We're trying to work both of these in, but come on, we all have enough time to do yeah. both. Frank Miller Frank weekend. Miller weekend. I think really, we've come across something. Yes. Today. Well, after Frank Miller weekend passes, we'll be seeing <laughs> several other movies, but that's going to be a weekend to remember. Good call. Hat tip to um, whoever pointed that out online. I'm sorry, I don't remember where. I, I, I that, love but. it. You know, another thing I love is Deadpool, especially this. <laughs> second trailer that dropped over the Christmas holidays. It actually dropped on Christmas Day. It's funnier than the first, in my opinion. How crazy is this film going to be? In fact, they just had another viral marketing thing drop yesterday. Um, all during The Bachelor, they had another Deadpool commercial with Deadpool smelling roses and talking about like what the film really is about is love. And like <laughs> they show a couple of quick shots of him and love and this and that. And then it, cut, it ends with him like, what are you going to do on Valentine's Day weekend or whatever? So another great it's selling brilliant. point. Yeah, it, it's really just really fun. So I went and saw Force Awakens at the Chinese in IMAX. And right. the first thing that shows up is Deadpool <laughs> eating a chimichanga. He goes, look at me. I'm eating a chimichanga. And then the camera pans down and there's a giant chimichanga on his lap. And he goes, and this is a chimichanga in IMAX. <laughs> so the, the marketing team... I don't know if Ryan Reynolds thought this up. I don't know who thought this up. It's the greatest movie ad campaign ever. Yeah. I mean, in terms of, but the movie's got a lot to live up to. It better not be snakes on a plane. Uh, 
I'm glad you said that. Better it, not be snakes on a plane. You know what? Even if the movie sucks, we'll always have this viral marketing campaign. Like I'm like, <laughs> I could rewatch this as a movie. Right. Just like it's almost more than a movie now. So. If they don't like, they have to put the stuff on the eventual home video releases, right? right. Like so we can all just sit there oh, and watch yeah. like, the Blu-ray 4K digital cube that you swallow in another day. You know, well, <laughs> another C- year. CES <laughs> now, 20th Century Fox announced ultra high definition. They're going no, in the ultra HD 4K, 4K format. Just in case you were That's worried just, about getting Blu-ray, now there's another thing that you're like, I guess I'm going to have to upgrade. you got to upgrade uh, your television yeah. and you're going to have to upgrade. Yeah. And, and Panasonic isn't making plasmas anymore. Guess I'm what? They can sad. suck it because I'm not doing that. <laughs> they can blow me. It's not, I'm not doing that. I've just spent so much money and time getting Blu-rays and all this other stuff. I'm like, I'm sorry. I don't need to see every pore on their face. I'm, I'm cool with it being slightly super perfect. It doesn't have to be absolutely perfect but in 4K. But it's only mostly absolutely yeah, perfect. Yeah, it's only mostly. In 4K, you see, it's a get away from me. <laughs> I banish you to next year, 2017. I'm not even going to talk about 4K ever again until next year. Maybe I'll talk about it, but... Anyway, let's move on. Deadpool, you guys, I got any last things to say about that Deadpool trailer you guys saw? Uh, you know, I just want it to be good. I want it to be good because I've already, you know, I'm already ready to pre-order the figure. I know. So, I know. I, it's, it's Please like, be good. I've already good. spent money. I, I want it to be good. <laughs> and, and it looks, you know what I like about this? Here's an actor like Ryan Reynolds. I haven't seen an actor go this all in. Into a, a in terms of, of of making a movie, putting it out there, you got to give him a lot of credit because who, what other actor would do this? I think this is the end of this either is the end or the beginning of his career, right? And it also is the, the beginning of the Marvel mutant universe. Remember, we got Colossus coming mm-hmm. in this movie, and I think there's a lot a lot uh, uh, that's resting on on it for everyone involved. <laughs> and I like to see him the way he's gone all in. I think, I think you've hit on it cool. like that love is contagious yeah. in some of these things. And it feels like they're having such a good time. And the things they love about making a Deadpool movie are the things everybody wants out of a Deadpool movie. Like, if that's not your thing, you're not going to yeah. enjoy this movie. But it's going to be a Deadpool movie. And it's going to have those qualities. And that's terribly exciting. You know, like you said, it's like love actually said. Love is all around <laughs> us. And I think that this <laughs> Christmas season, mm-hmm. like my annual viewings of Love Actually, <laughs> the Deadpool ad campaign, Brought me love too. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. No, thanks, Ryan Reynolds, and everyone behind all this craziness because it is contagious. And it's like anybody who doesn't like these Deadpool, you know, trailers, don't go see the movie. <laughs> You'll be in the minority for sure because I think it's going to make a lot of money. I think it's going to make a lot of bank for being an R-rated superhero film. I'm sure we'll get a lot of copycats who don't actually understand why it's doing what it's doing <laughs> or why it's funny. That, but. but I'm looking forward to seeing this movie. More than ever now, you know. And I have to also say that that uh, I'm kind of happy for Rob Liefeld. I, I'm a big Rob Liefeld fan. I yes. have to say, he's one of the funny funniest people I've ever met at a comic for convention. sure. And and he created Deadpool. Yep. And I think Deadpool is, of course, the quintessential Rob Liefeld character. And I like that it's he's getting a movie. I the supported with the mouth. Is getting a movie. yes. I supported Rob Liefeld through his entire awesome comics publishing like I didn't personally I wasn't like spot I would just bought every comic that he ever put out why because he hired Alan Moore when no one else would hire Alan Moore to do when, Supreme yes he he actually was like that guy's a great writer and I'm gonna support him though he was like you know banished from DC and Marvel and this and that because he's hard to work with yeah he's a crazy weird warlock he's a freakish guy he's also <laughs> one of the most talented writers ever so uh, you know I think Rob Liefeld's great in fact Rob Liefeld's gonna be on Heroes in the next few weeks I just contacted him and he said he'll be coming on the show can I be to, on it with him yes you guys can all come on because so. I love Rob Liefeld yeah, and so. he knows he knows and I'm gonna make him tell the spaceship story you gotta make right. him tell the young blood Rob, spaceship you're gonna, story Rob you're going to tell the young spaceship story young blood <laughs> the young blood spaceship story from, from 1994 Comic Con because right. it's one of the funniest stories you'll ever hear awesome well yet yeah, Rob now you have to come on the show so yeah. uh, we'll be seeing him on in the, in the coming weeks but right now we're gonna go to minor mutations it's something I like to talk about it's little things that happened over the last few weeks and we're gonna just run through it number one we got Firestorm is now gonna be Death Storm in Flash season two we got Chris Hemsworth talking about Thor being possibly in Guardians of the Galaxy. That's what he wants, is what he said. Number three, we've got Lex Luthor super armor seen in the Batman v Superman toy release. Are they going to actually make Lex Luthor wear this weird, crazy armor? Who knows? It could just be one of the variant toys. There's also a weird green Batman that probably won't be in the movie. That's also a toy. So we got James Gunn. He's seen Civil War, and he says it's one of Marvel's best movies 
ever. We've got Ant-Man hitching a ride on Hawkeye's bow in a promo picked. It's exactly like the cover of Avengers 223. Check out that flavor. You're going to see Ant-Man on a bow see, shot by it's Hawkeye. Kevin Feige was sitting around and someone brought him that comic. Like, and he goes, I want that the comics the over yeah. there. And they were really fanning great. him with a Doctor Strange. He was like, I'm so, I tire of this Doctor Strange. Bring forth the Hawkeye and Ant-Man <laughs> series now. Some other weird stuff. <laughs> yes, master. <laughs> Is that job open? Because the job, I would totally fetch comics. I think Feige has needs a constant flow of people. And if there comics, isn't that right. job, there is after this show. Ends. That's right. Feige's like, they came up with a good job. I need seven comic fetchers immediately yeah. and three fanners. <laughs> yeah. It's a new it's a new terminology. Fan I'm a fanner at Marvel. So that's our minor mutations. What do you guys want to talk about from that group? That listing? Anything hit you? Well, I, I go ahead. Well, uh, I, I can't speak to Deathstorm specifically because I have only just started watching Flash. Right. But for the record, it's amazing, and I'm so glad I'm finally watching these shows. I am, too. Let me say that I binge-watched Flash Season 1 and finished it. Yes, all you nerds can back <laughs> off now. Get off my back. I've seen Flash Season 1. <laughs> now stay back. I warn you, stay back. I will finish uh. Season 2.1. One, I know they did like 10. They took a break. I'll get through it before they start season 2.2 because it's so much fun. Flash, have you finished season one no, yet? No, I'm only a few episodes in. I just did the first two seasons of Arrow. I'm trying to space them out. Don't, don't do Arrow. Just do I Flash. Liked it, I know, man. but I I'm just saying. I was just going to get through it to get to Flash based on what I'd heard. And then I totally love Are you love like kind of like doing that? Like no, Arrow, yeah, Flash, yeah. Arrow, Flash? All right. But we only I just started. Yeah. Flash, that's <laughs> so incredible. I, I literally watched 15 in a row because I watched the first five like a couple months ago and I was like, holy crow, this is incredible. And then got super busy. And then I had mentioned, I was like, why, when are you going to finish it? I was like, I will eventually, just like Daredevil. I was like, I got to get other stuff to do. Fin just forced myself to watch it over the last two weeks. Not even forced, it was just like, I literally watched like 10 in a row because it was so much fun. Have you seen? seen yes, and I'll yet? tell you something. This It kind of struck me that I was late to the flash boat. You know, I, I, I came late and then I did the same thing. I binge watched it. The show, when I was a kid, I was a DC guy. That I never read Marvel, I couldn't deal with Marvel the fl until I reached adolescence and then it was Teen Titans and X-Men. That was, X-Men was totally. my gateway drug back into the Marvel. I used to sit around with my neighbor kids and the neighbor kids and I was a Justice League guy and they were an Avengers guy. And it was like, the Vision could beat up Superman and Silver Surfer is the most powerful. And I'm like, no way, man, you know, and I had these fights. But The Flash made me, f watching that show, made me feel the way I felt reading Justice League of America comics when mm. I was 10 years old. I mean, it's, it's sophisticated. It's adult, but it's it 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 has that spirit of fun, and yet it's it's got great sci-fi concepts. It's really interesting. The characterizations are great. I love the costume. Mm -hmm. I mean, Flash is is a perfect example of what to do with DC, and they've really nailed it. That's why I can't wait for Legends of Tomorrow. Yeah, I cannot believe that show's even happening. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm like, we all oh saw my. that coming. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I, you know, there's a lot of people. The intelligentsia has whoa. When's this superhero nightmare that's destroyed pop culture going to end? Mm -hmm. I hope never. I love these. As long as these shows are done well, they're like procedurals, they're like lawyer shows, whatever. Mm -hmm. I'll watch them all as long as they're good. And Flash is one of the best. It really it's is. probably one of the best comic adaptations ever done. I really like uh, like uh, Barry's relationship with his stepdad. Absolutely. I, I, I love that relationship. It's like so real. And it's like there's also these like funny elements of course when Mark Hamill shows up it's like they went full camp with him but yet at the same time it was a lot of fun to see like you know his uh, his apprentice who's actually his son a little flavor with the Star Wars thing, well, and even know? bringing the character back bringing yes. the trickster back I mean that was amazing having so him so much come honor back. to what's gone before like just in the DNA of that show I mean Greg Berlanti's probably got fanners and people who are bringing him <laughs> right. comics and he's yeah. like oh let me see what I'm gonna do next yeah, he's got the TV version it's a little right. le lower budget it's like half a comic <laughs> or the digest version but still <laughs> he's like I've got two fanners and Eight carriers. <laughs> so, you know, we saved money on Yeah, fanners, we saved money on fanners. Fanners. So Berlanti's kind of like the TV version of Kevin Feige. Very much so. Yeah, he's rocking the boat, yo. He's well, got like four in production, five in production right now. They've so. both been successful based on, uh, like, they obviously have both made big changes to continuity, but they're both, like, faithful to the spirit of what the comics are, which is the thing we've all been waiting for. I yeah, and know. I think, you know, like, his big misfire is Green Lantern. So he was in charge of Green Lantern. And, you know, no one on this panel liked Green Lantern. And it's obviously, it's a bummer because we all wanted to. But I think he learned from his mistakes. It's like, hey, look, you know, they, the stuff they did on Oa was very faithful to the comic book. 
everything outside of that was what the hell's going on. Got a guy screaming with a giant head. It was like, what is, you know, it was all over the place. I'd love to see Green Lantern come on to Arrow and Green Lantern and Greeno travel the United States, like the old Neil Adams <laughs> 70s right. comic. Adams you know, that cover, like, my ward Speedy is a junkie. Know, and then they right? dealt with all the, the problems of the day. Well, that's like, Denny O'Neill. No, that's we still Denny haven't dealt with racism in comics. Oh, did I say Doug Bench? No, no, you, didn't, no, you just it, said Neil Adams. It's yeah, it's Denny O'Neill. Denny O'Neill, Neil, yeah. uh, that was the famous yeah. Denny O'Neill, Neil, Neil Adams run. And I remember when the DC released those as Baxter paper reprints oh, in yeah. the early 80s. I'm like, I have those. Yeah, they're great. Yeah, I mean, and then I had to, that's the triple, quadruple, super dipple, double, double, you know, where they're like, here's this reprint, 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 then hardcover, then software side. I eventually was like, look, I've got all these hardcovers. Like, I got to get rid of this other stuff. But I've got them. They're really and, fun and to read. The artwork, those, by the way, those comics are great. Go check them out. Yeah, they're available in trade paperback. And you could probably get them at House of Secrets. <laughs> What's Thank up? You. And Meltdown. Yep. Shout outs. So, um, yeah, definitely, you know, Green Lantern, he should show up in Arrow, but Flash is incredible. I'm so happy to finally have been caught up with it. And now, you know, so Deathstorm. So, oh, if, yes. yeah, if you're, not, right. if you're not 100%, <laughs> we love to tangent on this show. If you're not 100% through watching, Flash season one, like I wasn't. I was like, you know, I wasn't even aware really that Firestorm was in that season. You know, there's also Gorilla Grodd. There's a whole bunch of really cool, Dude, come on, you know, characters. And yeah, it's weird to know, but it, it not you're like, Grodd. Body. No, not God. It's Grodd. I love that little flavor. And well, and also that's another thing where I, I see Berlani like, I bet they'll dare me to do Gorilla Grodd. Watch me. Watch that's me right. do it. And, and successfully. Yeah. And they did. Um, what do you think of that Lex Luthor outfit? Do you think it's just a toy or? Um, prob uh, you know what? Maybe not. Maybe Lex joins in the fight against Doomsday. I don't know. Mm. But I, I, I've, to be honest, I've always hated that costume. I've never liked the colors. I always thought it was kind of dumb. I never believed, like, look, that's so superpowers, 1985. When did they introduce that suit? I don't know. I think it was like the know. same time that Brainiac became that super robotic right. Brainiac. Because I, I had that issue. It's like, you know, Lex Luthor has a super armored outfit, and then Brainiac is now this skeletal, like Terminator looking guy with a brain robot brain. Even as a kid, I'm like, look, if I was Lex Luthor and I designed a power armored suit, it would not be in those colors. <laughs> I just that that's not they, that does not scream super villain going to take over the Lex world. Lex is like, I will make it and blue and yellow. They are traditional villain colors, right? Yeah, but it's Jean Paul Gaultier direct, uh, did that costume, you know, like he did the Judge Dredd costume that's for right. Stallone's movie. I mean, come on, man. I don't know. I think he probably just likes the color green because kryptonite represents. Yeah. Although it makes sense. I mean, they're they're gonna make as long as they make a hot toy of it. I'd buy that. (laughs) (laughs) He will buy the armored supervillain Lex Luthor, even if he hates it. But uh, because they'll they'll dim the colors down. It does seem like a weird thing to make if it's not in the movie anywhere. So I guess that would be me guessing. Probably at some point there'll be something. Yeah. Or who knows if that's Lex in there? He has an art. You know, maybe an army of uh, robot drones. (laughs) For uh, yeah, whatever. Anyway, the, the, other the thing house wanna, party protocol, as it yeah. were. Yeah. The other thing I want to mention is that Ant Man being on Hawkeye's bow, I think, is just out of this world, incredible, and really fun. That they were, like took the time to actually. That was in the comics. That's in the animated series. So that's going to call out to a lot of fans. Like, oh, that's good to see. Yeah. Well, it's great. Again, another example of how the Marvel Cinematic Universe is really, really treating their source material honorably, as opposed to so many other franchises that don't. Yeah. For sure. Well, speaking of franchises, let's move into Batman. This week's flashback is 1989's Batman. This feature feature length Batman movie happened back in 1989, coming out after the recent publication of Frank Miller's epic and transformative comic book series, The Dark Knight Returns, which turned Batman to, into a creature of vengeance and retold the story of the of uh, in both dark and cinematic tones, forever changing the comic book reader's perception of the Batman. The, wor- the world was hit with Batmania once again, only this time it was in the 60s campy TV spin, but a darker vision that brought forth by, was brought forth by Tim Burton and his amazing design team. This was the public's very first taste of a gritty and scarier Batman, not the Biff Bang Pow campy comedy that they were accustomed to from the 1960s TV series. The film starred Michael Keaton as Bruce Wayne, Jack Nicholson as the Joker, with a combo soundtrack by Danny Elfman and Prince. The film was produced by John Peters, who cast his then-girlfriend Kim Bassinger as Vicki Vale. Um, He was also instrumental in getting a young Tim Burton on board to bring his vision to the screen. We finally got the grim and gritty, psychologically damaged Dark Knight detective. Let's talk about 1989's Batman. Start off with you, Robert. You know, I actually was at the world premiere 
of Batman in, we- in Westwood. I was at the world premiere. I, there, it was in two theaters. It was at the Fox and the Bruin. I was in the Bruin. I had a reserve seat. I was in Jack Nicholson's aisle. Wow. But I did not like the movie very much. Right. I have to say, uh, it, was a, it was disappointing to me. It was so weird and Baroque that it didn't have, it kind of just sits there. It's kind of inert. It doesn't have any forward momentum. I like the design, Anton first, God rest his soul. Mm-hmm. I love the design work. I love the Batmobile. I did, in fact, buy the Hot Toys Batmobile from the <laughs> 1989 Batman. Uh, but I, I love the design work. I loved Keaton as Batman. I loved Vicki Vale. I loved Nicholson as the Joker. But the film just feels like molasses to me. I like the elements of it, but right. I don't like the movie itself. It's a little... I, I know what you said when you said earlier, languid is a good word. Languid. Um, how about you, Amy? What do you think of it? Well, it's funny. I was expecting when I saw it on the list, I was like, oh, and then we'll all talk about how much we loved it. Mm-hmm. Because I, I forget that there are other opinions on this movie, but I saw it so young. I had no critical faculties about everything. Like, this was this one in Batman Returns, I think I probably saw around the same time. And they were just like, oh, the first two Batman movies. This is what Batman movies should be like. And that remained my impression until the Chris Nolan ones came out. And right. now I just love them both. But it... It's like I haven't rewatched it as much as as Batman Returns. Right. Um, but it, it to me, I was just like, oh well, of course, this is this is the Batman movie. That's. Well, I mean, look, I love Batman Returns, which is interesting. Like, why would I love Batman Returns so much? But I, I think Batman Returns is more Tim Burton. Mm. It's it gets weirder, and I mm. really love Michelle Pfeiffer as Catwoman, and and Danny DeVito is a little gross, but I liked him as the Penguin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like the whole that whole Jesus myth angle or Moses or whatever going down the river, right. and he was raised by penguins, which is just insane and weird. <laughs> but I liked it. But I like that. Yeah, it's not afraid to be insane and weird. And yeah, I mean, it, it it it's. Whereas the first Batman, I just, there was so much, if you guys don't remember, there was so much hype for Batman. I was stealing Batman bus station posters. I had one too in my loft, dude. I stole a Batman train station from Chicago sign and had it in our loft for like two or three years. Stole a Batman poster (laughs) and then we got a little greedy because it was the summer of 89. We were going to try and go for an Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade poster, but cops showed up wow we had to run but uh but the the poster was great and that last trailer i think you said john peters cut yeah. that trailer yeah one of the great movie trailers of all time doesn't give anything away in terms of plot but makes you want to see that movie yeah and they just they cut it together there's actually no soundtrack to it no. it's just a series of really cool scenes that, that says this is what batman is i remember seeing that that trailer when I was in college, it was my very first year of college, and I was like, what is this? It's gonna be incredible. Right. Because I had just read Dark Knight Returns, so I was like super sweaty about the Frank Miller version of Batman. I'd been a Batman fan my entire life since a little kid watching the 60s Batman. Then I read all of the 70s and 80s Batmans. I just read all of them. Doug Monk, all of the Alan Davis, you name it, I was reading all of them. And I just loved Batman. And then once he got into this kind of darker version of Batman, it made sense as I got older. I was like, that makes sense. If he's weird enough, put on a Batman outfit, he's gotta be messed up. You know, so it just made <laughs> sense that he's extra violent and freakish and more angry about the death of his family. So there was all this stuff that really kind of rang true, I think, to a lot of Batman fans. I'll say this, Batman, the 1989 film, it's not as dark as like obviously Chris Nolan took it. No. It's definitely not the Dark Knight that Frank Miller wrote. It has that that Tim Burton levity to it, which I felt really worked with the Joker. And I thought that, you know, when he, after, he electrocutes the guy, he's like, I'm glad you're dead. You know, he's like, you know, choking up his necktie a little bit. I love those scenes. There's elements to that first Batman that I absolutely love. Every time that Prince music comes on, I die a little. I feel like, ah! <laughs> okay. <laughs> Damn, but the, but the dance band. So I was like, stop it. Well, stop it. Okay, look, I'm the biggest Prince fanatic in the world. I am I'm too, a massive, dude. And, I love and Prince, I, except for that. Bat dance, when I saw that video, I'm like, dude, Prince, Kill me. my man, what's going on? But I will say this if you look at that soundtrack, there's The Future is a good song, Electric Chair is a good song, Vicky Waiting is a good Omega song. Omega Unknown or the song. I remember that you were listing them off. I was like, I remember all those horrible titles. Well, the thing I is, I remember they listening were, to it. I was like, I hate it. I mean, you gotta love because you know Tim Burton was probably listening to Lady Cab Driver or International Lover mm-hmm. driving into the studio all day, and he's like, I wonder if I can get Prince. And we'll do it like 1999. It'll be a double album. I seriously doubt it. I'm sure it was a great idea at the I time. don't know if Tim Burton <laughs> had anything to do with getting Prince. I think he was like, can I please have Danny Elfman only score this and not have Prince? There's I no think it was way. Force it was Tim Burton all the way. Yeah. I think, yeah, and I, 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 I think those songs that I listed are actually great Prince songs. The Future is a great right. Prince song. 
They don't, electric chairs they do are great not work in Batman. They don't, and they weren't all. used very well. Right, it was like when he, the Joker's running for mayor, he's like, "Who wants some money?" You got the Prince song going all on. Hail, new yeah. king! Yeah. You're like, why are all these people yeah. in Gotham dancing all of a sudden? You know what I mean? Because like, Joker's a party man. That's right. He is a party man. He's a party man. I love Jack Nicholson as the Joker. I think I need to rewatch this specifically as like the Batman musical that I've never. That's imagined. right. There's <laughs> a lot of elements in there. Um, it's a really fun film, and I thought it, what it did for comic book viewers or comic book readers at the time is it introduced comic book culture to the mass audience. Because at that time in 1989, you could have asked anybody who what they thought of Superman or Batman or Spider-Man and they would have laughed at you and be like, that's for little children, that's for kids. Right. Or they would have been like, oh, Batman is that Biff Bang Pow, it's, that, it's for kids and it's a comedy and it's goofy and stupid. Or he and, hangs out with the outsiders. But that's what I'm saying is that <laughs> they probably basically- would not. The average, <laughs> public member was probably not going, that guy, the Outsiders are lame. I love Halo. <laughs> I like Batman and the Outsiders. I but, do too. But what I'm saying, I'm saying especially when Kevin existed. Nolan was drawing it, but I, what I'm saying is that Batman opened the door to be to be public, publicly accepted to read graphic novels and comic books and not be uh, ashamed of it as as that I when I grew up in as a comic book reader in high school especially people would make fun of me because I read comics you're a nerd but not in a cool way like nerds now are cool back then you'd get beat up and laughed at if you were into comic books I felt like this was at least a cool first step and I didn't hate Batman I I actually I didn't love it I really liked it I loved Batman Returns for all the reasons we talked about so but you know I think your points really well taken because the the 89 Batman film was sort of the culmination of how DC and Marvel had, there was a comic renaissance in the 80s. Yeah. You know, it really started with the direct sale market, but then you had Dark Knight comes out and then Batman Year One comes out. So Batman had been reinvented in the end of that. It was like a four year, it was, you had basically starting in 86, 85, 86, yeah. Crisis on Infinite Earths. Burn, Superman. All that, and then the whole revamp of the DC universe, and then this was a culmination. It, it took it out of the comic pages, but because of this movie, everyone was, Pop culture, the the culture at large, was looking back at the comics that had come out throughout the '80s and how they'd grown up, mm -hmm. and this was the culmination of that. So I think a lot of comic readers, like you said, a lot of people that might not have ever picked up a comic, came into the comic world because of this film. I have heard a lot of, of stories press. from people who that was their their gateway was the '89 yeah. Batman. Yeah, it was a very successful mm -hmm. gateway drug into the whole world of superheroes. So for that, I think Batman deserves a very special place. And it's also a fun film. It's it's hard to compare it. I agree with you. The pacing is a little off. We were both at the ArcLight screening that they had for its anniversary screening last year, and it still holds up. I mean, it's a 1989 film. It's a superhero film. There's certain scenes that, yes, in our world now would have been cut a little differently or squeezed a little tighter there's things that could have been snipped in a little bit but for the film that it is i think it's a it's a really fun film it's imaginative and and creatively done and and establishes batman and gets him outside of the biff bang pow world and into a more adult take on batman regardless as to whether if they you gotta hit a man with glasses you know it's like well yes he is <laughs> it's like um we probably underestimate how how much that could have not worked like yes. how risky it was to be like, I'm going to make a Batman movie. People are going to take it seriously. It will kick off like a dozen more Batman movies. And you were probably like, uh-huh, sure. Yeah, well, let me ask you, risk. Uh, how do you feel about Tim Burton having spent time with him and having worked with him? How do you feel about how Tim Burton treated the archetype of a superhero? I really like it because he was really actually more concerned with uh, why someone would dress up like a bat. He was he was he was attacking it like someone would attack a story that's you have your beginning, middle, and end, and also trying to realize it's a cinem it's a cinematic world. It's a it's not a, a cartoon, a drawn world. So you have to bring uh, three dimensionality to the characters. You have to give them, you have to have the audience care about the characters. Why would they care about Bruce Wayne? They have to know that he is obsessed with his family's death and their murder and he wants to avenge them every night he puts on this weird suit. Why does he put on the weird suit? Because he's tiny and he needs to strike fear into them. How would he do that? By making, that's why the, when you look at what Tim Burton did, he took all the color out of Batman and made him just this dark figure because it's scarier. If he's bright, if he's like, hey, I'm gonna beat you up now he's got gray and he's got the blue tights and stuff it's not as free it still would be freaky i would still be like get away from me <laughs> if some dude rounded a corner in a weird outfit i'd be like what the hell's going on but if he's in total darkness floating down it's creepy and scary so. what what's really would have been interesting is if the internet existed can you imagine fanboys going 
wait a minute, the director of Pee Wee's Big Adventure and Beetlejuice was given Batman to direct? I mean, the world would have gone yes. insane. And a lot of people, what people don't remember is that we comic book sweaties back in the day were like, Michael Keaton's going to play Batman? <laughs> yeah. Like, are you kidding people me? People freaked out. There was freaked letter out. writing. Yeah. So it's like, it's the same thing that like in, in my doc, The Death of Superman Lives, what happened? It's about Nicolas Cage as Superman. People freaked out. But on the internet, instead, it was like the internet was around to help destroy that film. Yeah. You know, back in 89, it was not. They were almost, we're going to, a lot of people were very nervous about Michael Keaton playing Batman. So. But I remember reading, you know, back in the, like, remember Amazing Heroes, that magazine? Oh, yeah. I loved it. Like, people would write these long treatises about why Michael Keaton shouldn't play Batman, or you'd read in Comic Buyer's yeah. Guide, or somebody, or uh, maybe even Peter David wrote a, a, a defense column of when he used to write that column. You know, what was that column called? I forget. I Peter David, he wrote a column every, was it in Comic Buyer's Guide? Every every week he wrote a column or something? Well, it was a, it was an interesting time, and a lot of people <laughs> went bananas that Michael Keaton played Batman. Yeah. And that and is it, a good point, that before we had the internet, there were fanzines. There were, like, message boards in between the early internet stages. There were places that people were having these conversations. And in I the guess. backs of comic books. There used to be mm -hmm. letters, Ella Locks, letters of comment, you know, in the back of... Sure. Uh, but I used to love that. But it was a, a very much a smaller community because the internet, the, the great thing about the internet is it opens up and binds us all together, but also opens it up to like everyone. Force. Yeah, it, it opens it up everyone to feeling dark side. we're all part of this thing now. I mean, I, that's how I feel about it as opposed to like, let's have our small group. And I don't think Michael Keaton says he's too short. Like this weird group of people. Imagine if they ruled everything. It would, you wouldn't have a Batman movie. So No, or Brian Singer probably wouldn't have cast six foot two Hugh exactly, Jackman as Wolverine. Opposite. They're like, well, he's supposed to be short. And it's like, well, not anymore. And everybody loves him now. So <laughs> shut up. So is it, it's one of those things that, you know, everybody complains about it until it happens. And then they see it. I remember Heath Ledger. Heath Ledger as a joke. It's horrible. Now everybody's dressed as him. You know, it's like, <laughs> right. let's move on to a thing we call Spotlight. This week, we are going to talk about the it's just Black Hole by <laughs> Charles Burns. It's a, a dark and disturbing comic book series, uh, which follows a group of high school kids who have sex and transmit a bug, the bug, which gives them creepy and bizarre mutations. They all hang out together in the woods at a dark campfire and things get even weirder. The surreal graphic novels, metaphors on puberty, sexual disease and becoming an adult are pushed into iconic greatness by Burns artistic stylings in his drawings, his stark black and white, almost woodcut inking style and his isolated framing, bringing a creepy horror movie take to this entire series would this comic book series be best as a translation in film or television and in that would it be best live action or animated how about you amy what do you think um normally i love live action versions of things but this one i i think an, an animated series if you could actually do like a serious animated television series that would let it be dreamy and episodic and find its place on one of the weird cable networks where people are okay with that, Like, then you might be able to do justice to it because it's such an unconventional thing. It's mm -hmm. not plotty in a normal right. way. That like some of the conflict stuff doesn't even come in until two thirds of the way through and there's a lot of like dream sequences, but they're so purely imagined with Charles Burns writing and art that I don't know how you would do this live action and, and do any justice to that vision of the world. I, if my directing career amounted to something after Free Enterprise came out, I desperately would have wanted to adapt this as a live action. I mean, film. I would watch it. I would I, instantly it, tune into it. Oh, yeah. it, it's set in Seattle, you know, in the '70s, my hometown, and I've always wanted to do a great Seattle. No one's done the great Seattle movie yet, and I always thought that this. I mean, there's Sleepless in Seattle, but mm -hmm. that's a little. It, it wasn't really about Seattle. This could be about. I would set. I would actually do this, but set it during the grunge rock era when mm. grunge was breaking so have that music scene sort of surrounding what was going on but uh i love this comic i mean this comic is a is a it's very i love the early films of david cronenberg this is a very cronenberg-esque comic um i really love the relationships and and you know when we were growing up aids herpes all these horribly sexually transmitted diseases were the big thing and everybody was getting them now it's like Everyone has herpes. Who cares? <laughs> but this 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 comic is really about that fear and that horror. The way Cronenberg's The Fly. Sure. People said it's an AIDS metaphor, but I love this comic, and I love the the hard. I have the hardcover version mm -hmm. of it. I didn't buy the individual issues. I I love it. I can't recommend it highly enough. Yeah, I agree. I, I bought the individual individual issues, and there was a gap. I remember, and then they started republishing it, and then I lost touch with it, and then the hardcover came out, and I bought that. And See, it's, that must uh, have been an amazing experience. I read it all at once. I read the single issues, but I yeah. got I binged 
pushed through them. And the fact that it took 10 years to actually publish this. Yeah. It was infuriating. Like, I, to be honest, like, <laughs> I, I sometimes get infuriated. Remember, yeah. I was like, I was in the comic book shop. I was like, where is this one comic? It's like, I've been waiting six months for issue six. I was so irritated. It finally came out. And then I shut up. I was happy. But it was like, <laughs> it's that, that kind of thing that only happened. I remember how long I had to wait between issues seven and eight of Watchmen. <laughs> Almost a year. A whole year. How when? about Camelot 3000 number 12? Yes. <laughs> that took a year. Yeah. Like, I'm like, what? Or, What's going, I'm going to go or, find Brian Boland and kill him so that yeah. he won't finish you, the comic. Or yeah. Alan Moore's big numbers. <laughs> yeah, that never Bill, finished. Bill, Alan Moore and Bill Sienkiewicz. <laughs> What there's like two or three? I have two, two of them. Two of them. Yeah, yeah I want. I'm and still waiting. In but this years, was like the Ultimate Wolverine versus Hulk was a, a trendsetter in the like, wow, will any of us be alive? <laughs> no. <laughs> but so but they this one got worth finished. It. Worth the wait. <laughs> I think yeah. I think the drifting storytelling also feels very Lynchy. So right. It's David Lynchy. Yes. It feels very like, much so. I I I, I would I. I would, you could do it in like a Twin I, Peaks van. I think yeah. you could do it live action like that. I worry about the animation because I love it as the drawings and the still art that it is. And having directed a ton of animation, I would find this uh, quite hard to uh, translate mm. into an animated form. I think because, you know, you'd be bound by the compositions of, of Charles Burns already. So, you know, then you'd have to either just adapt the, you know, do a, you know, a, a motion comic is what they call it, which is what I would highly suggest if they were going to do something like that anyway, and not come up with your own new things. Because the way that Charles Burns, he's the writer and the artist, he told the story. It's a very personal story. If it's you begin pure. to abstract Every bit of it feels it, consistent. And exactly. When you start to distill it and turn it into something else, another form of media, you have to transform it. And I feel personally that you have to fully transform it if you are gonna transform it into something else. So you, the comic already exists. I don't need to, I hate motion comics. That's me personally, I absolutely detest them. So because I'm like, I got the comic, I don't need you to slide stuff around, get lost. You know, that's how I feel about it. <laughs> oh, you moved something, get out of here. Um, you need to really, if you're gonna make it, you gotta make it and you gotta, you have to, you know, take time to transform it. So I, I, I would love to see it as a TV series, like an eight episode series. I think it would work great. That's what I think. Can so. you imagine how bananas the parents of the audience that this would be directed at would go or would be? I mean, this is such a har r. This is a we're unrepentantly having sex, and this mm -hmm. is what happens now. I we're spend the whole thing getting high. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's drugs and sex and rock and roll. I mean, it's it's pretty it's pretty adult material. It's, yeah. you know, it's the perfect rebellious teen thing to love. I think it's well, and then it's, they'd be like, yeah. it's really deep, but for once they'd be right. Right, right. The, very right. And I think it's high time that it gets adapted. I think, I think every 16-year-old's parent should discover the hardcover of Black Hole in their kid's bedroom. <laughs> That's, you know, yeah, can it, can like, audiences uh -oh. tolerate the dreaminess and the sort of wandering? Like, cause It's completely worth it. But I that's think, something I, you can get away with that in a book. I think that they would be able to tolerate it, especially if it wasn't, if it wouldn't be on one of the main networks. It wouldn't be on ABC or CBS. I think it would have to be on one of the pay-per-view cable channels. It's a great, it's a great thing for HBO. HBO or mm. Showtime, something like that. It would be perfect for us. FX, so. we're looking at you. Yeah, so cable people, get on it. All right. We're going to move on to the Twitter questions this week. We've got Gabriel Bailey. He says, should toy companies release images of certain toys that could provide spoilers to films? Well, Gabriel, well, we have that happen quite a lot. We just, we're talking about one, which is a Lex Luthor armored outfit. We have no idea if that's going to be in the movie or not. We've seen recently uh, with Civil War, we've seen, uh, you know, hey, check out the Hot Toys Giant Man action figure. You're like... <laughs> Oh, I guess Giant Man's going to be this like advertised everywhere. You're like, hey, it's, there's a Lego Giant Man. Look, it's Lego. It says Giant Man on it. No one said anything about it except for these toys. Is there going to be is Giant Man going to show up in Civil War? Probably, and it's not even a spoiler. It's everywhere. You know, if you don't use the internet, you might be a little bit angry right now. But if you're on the internet, you've probably scrolled past several articles talking about Giant Man. So relax with the spoilers. It's not a spoiler. What do you guys think about toys? possibly showing things that are going to be in a film that they haven't released yet. Well, it's un it's unfortunate. It bothers me. I mean, I don't like I don't want to learn 
spoilers from toys. But on the other hand, I understand that there's a it, it takes long enough for a Hot Toys figure to get in my hot, <laughs> grubby little hands, like years sometimes. But these toys have to come out when the movie comes out, usually before. They want toys coming out months before to sort of ramp up to the release because they have to be they have to have permeated the retail establishments when the movie comes out so they can sell. Yeah. So it's sort of the nature of the beast. It's a damned if you do, damned if you don't. I I, I remember not that it was that long ago, but when Guardians came out, everybody instantly wanted a tiny potted Groot. Yes. Uh, but they didn't even get those out in time for Christmas. Of that no one year. even thought to make one. Right. Well, they said that like that they didn't want to start production. I don't know if this was an excuse, but they said they didn't want to start production on them because a tiny baby potted planted Groot would be a spoiler. Right. Um, and they didn't want that imagery out there, and they didn't want everyone being like, "Why is there a tiny baby Groot? Maybe he has a kid. Whatever." But uh, apparently, that's how long it takes. Is that the movie had to come out, and then they were like, "Oh, we're announcing it. It's going to be there," and they still couldn't make Christmas. So I hate having things spoiled by toys, but man, they're in a bind. Yeah, with this for stuff. sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm amazed that Star Wars, you know, I'm not going to talk about Star Wars, so you cry <laughs> babies. Spoilers, relax. Um, but, you know, it's a few weeks out now. All of us have seen it a few times, at least. Um, they were able to not reveal anything until the movie came out. And that was, I got to say, pretty spectacular. really amazing. I was very happy that all I saw were those trailers. And yes, some people are like, I'm not watching any more than that first trailer. I watched all the trailers and it didn't ruin anything. I know people get super weird about, don't ruin anything. Relax. Well, it's they like, did a, I mean, they did a fantastic job of using the toys, which came out for, what was it, Force Friday? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Where they released right. the toys and they kept Toys R Us's open. Yep. I mean, I was in line with Brian Fuller, who produced mm -hmm. Hannibal, right. the Toys R Us in uh, <laughs> Seth Atwater Green. Village. Yeah, you were at that. You know, that and then they thing. were, what was interesting, though, was they made us love those characters. Everybody wanted a BB-8 toy, and we didn't even know what he did in the movie. Right. And it, it wasn't a spoiler. They, okay, here's BB-8, a new character. You don't know what he did. Right. You don't know what he was doing. Is he in it for one second? You, you didn't know. <laughs> yeah. and, and so you learned who Ray, who Finn, and Kylo Ren were, all these new characters, because they had toys. So they're like, okay, here's our characters. But you had no idea what they did. Well, I'm so glad that Con I have that action figure of Constable Zuvio. Uh, he's going to be the face of this I know. forever. Yeah. If he's, anything he's needs Constable an Zuvio. extended edition, it's Star Wars. That's right. Seriously, they got all this footage, put it back. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how long it would be. It would be three hours. The I Force would all Reawakens. All of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, want, I can't wait for whatever super Blu-ray they're going to put out that has a whole extra hour. I'll watch all of it. I loved it. All right, let's move on to the next question. we got Darth Dunculus asks... Question, if Deadpool is successful, will Spider-Man break the fourth wall or have animated eyes? Well, um, we know that Daredevil has animated eyes. I don't think Spider-Man is going to have animated eyes. When they say animated eyes, they're talking about like CG eyes that grow in you know proportion. I don't think they're going to do that with Spider-Man. But I do think that he's going to break the fourth wall. Why? Because Kevin Feige mentioned several things that are clues to what the new Spider-Man is going to, the new Spider-Man movie is going to be. Not only is it going to take place in high school, but he also said, we want to go back to a time and in the 80s, like a Ferris Bueller's Day Off, where we had fun and this and that. When he mentioned, he could have said any other 80s film. He could have said Breakfast Club. He could have said any other 80s film. He said Ferris Bueller. Why? Because Ferris Bueller breaks the fourth wall, like I'm doing right now. I'm talking to you, <gasps> sweaty. I'm breaking the fourth wall. Now they know you're not fictional. I'm ooh, going into your TV. So that's basically what happens. That's what breaking the fourth wall is. It's talking to you. And so what happens? Deadpool talks to you. What happens? Ferris Bueller talks to you. And what happens? Spider-Man is going to be talking to you. He's going to be like, hey, I'm just the friendly neighbor at Spider-Man. Or I'm Peter Parker. But during the day, I do this. He is going to address the audience. And I think in that lies how they don't have to do an origin story. He can wash through it while he talks. I got bit by a spider and this happened. If, so. they, if they do a Ferris Bueller Spider-Man movie, it's going to be the greatest thing ever. He doesn't believe in Beatles. He just <laughs> believes in me. Good point there. Um, but the thing is, if they did that, Again, Kevin Feige saying, okay, Captain America Winter Soldier is going to be a throwback to 70s conspiracy thrillers. Right. In Kevin Feige's inner sanctum sanctorium where he's making all these amazing decisions, right. he's probably having all other people bring him movies and just line up with ideas. Yep. What if Spider-Man was like Ferris Bueller? That's, you know, the, the, the oh, message yeah. comes yes. down from on high. Why not? Why not go back? And they haven't done a Marvel John Hughes movie yet. No, they haven't. That's what he said, too. He wants to have this John Hughes flavor in the Spider-Man movie why is Kevin Feige in charge of Marvel Cinematic Films? Because he's very, very smart. He's in. I, I'm very happy he's in charge. I hope he's part of Phase Nine or whatever. However long they keep him, yeah. So 
what he's done with all these these Marvel films is he's made them very fun and singular to watch and, and a fun part of the overall fabric. He weaves them together, but they stand on their own. So I think the Spider-Man films we've gotten with Sam Raimi and then the Mark Webb Spider-Man films are now over. Um, this new incarnation of uh, the, you know, maybe the spectacular Spider-Man or whatever they're gonna call it. I think by going with this kind of approach, this obviously breaking the fourth wall, they're like, look at the success. They were already doing this, but I'm just saying, look at the success of the viral marketing of just Deadpool mm. because he's interacting with the audience. It's, it's grabbing them. That's what they're doing with Spider-Man. Deadpool might have beaten them to the punch, but that was the whole general idea that I think uh, you know six or seven months ago when Foggy mentioned it. That's what they're doing. I don't think they're going to do that in Civil War though. No, no. I mean, Absolutely they're not, not. going to do that in Civil War when he's introduced. It has to be a, a conceit of a. It's got to be like yes. Sony versus Spidey. Will yeah. Be. Yeah. yeah, it won't be. They're going to introduce Spider-Man in Civil War, but then when the Spider-Man movie proper happens, that's when we'll have that fourth wall breaking. Peter Parker talking to the audience, and I think it makes sense. It's a great way to reintroduce the Spider-Man a new Spider-Man to a new audience and just have him in high school and, and it'll be a fun way to introduce him. Hopefully those guys who wrote Vacation do a really good job because I hated Vacation and when I found out that those guys were writing Spider-Man, I really got super worried about it. But I know that Kevin Feige and all of Marvel have their hands in everything and they're gonna make sure that the script is tip top amazing, very funny, and hits all all cylinders. So. What if there was an actual Ferris Bueller cameo? Old Ferris Bueller and Sloan Peterson are still together. Just a, just a throwaway <laughs> gag. Kind of like Stan Lee, you know. If it was a throwaway gag, just cool. a throwaway gag. <laughs> if they were like in it for more than five seconds, no, 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 they're angry. just like on the streets of New York. Be awesome. They're Sloan, playing on Sloan and, and Uncle uh, May. I would and love Sloan that. and Ferris <laughs> going to the theater or something. <laughs> for sure, I would love a cameo. Let's move on. Manuel Trigueros asks, what's the difference between Dark Side and Mongol? So if you don't know who Mongol is, he's a character who looks a lot like Dark Side. He's just, he's just a slightly different shade of grayish uh, yellow. He's got a bizarre cap that's sort of very Dark Side-y. Basically, uh, Mongol is, a, is like, like the name Mongol, he's a, he's a a dude who kind of takes over worlds. He's a you know like a, a a giant pirate, you might say, who goes from planet to planet, and his goal is to to lord over everybody and have them worship him. Uh, Dark side is similar, but he's already kind of a god. He's basically like in the New Gods, which is Jack Kirby's world. You have uh, Apocalypse, which is the world that Dark Side commands, and he's lords over all these people. It would suck to be born on Apocalypse. So you'd be like, can I get a ticket to, what was it, Neo Genesis? <laughs> Neo Genesis. Yeah, Genesis. yeah, I'm like, well, I want to get out of here. You know, you're a dog soldier. You know, it's like, damn it. <laughs> turn, turn, turn you into a parrot demon. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, um, Although, then, I will say this. One of the great Superman comics of all time has Mongol in it, and Alan Moore wrote it. It is annual number 18. What do you 18. get for the man who what has everything? What do you get for yes. the man who has everything? Uh, that, that is one of the great, and, and you know what? The end of that, I don't want, no spoilers, but the end of that comic is kind of sweet. What happens to Mongol? I absolutely it's love it. And it has Batman, <laughs> Superman, and Wonder Woman, plus Robin. It's great, and it is actually, I highly recommend reading it. It is one of the greatest Superman standalone comics ever written because you get a clue and a key into the what makes all these characters work by this horrendous evil device that Mongol brings from him from some heinous universe. Oh, right. the, whatever the black flower of you know mind absorption <laughs> he throws on you're like, what the? Oh, and you're instantly thrown into what your mind's desire, your heart's desire, what you always wanted that you were denied. So obviously with Superman, Krypton never blew up. And he has his entire life just happening. Oh, now spoiler alert! No, no, no! It's I not love a spoiler. That we're respecting spoiler alert. Yeah. Just like a thirty-year-old comic. Yeah, this, we just this, care that much. This is <laughs> this is that you must read it. It's, I don't care if it's a spoiler. I'm not going to tell you how the middle or the ending. This happens right off the bat. Yeah. Batman shows up with Robin. He's like, "Hey, we got a Christmas present for Superman at the Fortress of Solitude." Yana, <laughs> yana. A little corny, a little you know, super friend style. Gets dark instantly. Superman is like literally the second page. He's got a weird flower, and he's like immobilized. It's frightening. It's freaky, and that's Mongol at his best. Dark side. There are uh, innumerable amounts of dark side stories. Just the most recent Jet, uh, Jim Lee Justice League had dark side as a main villain. They're, they're having I'm, a dark side war right now. Uh, exactly. He's always in everything. The so Cosmic Odyssey. Yeah, Remember he's a that? he's a yeah. The Mike Mc, the, the my introduction to Mike Mike Mignola is like I love the way he drew people. I love the way he drew Orion. It's like they look kind of cool, you know, with their little tiny feet, you know. And I just like the way he drew Superman. 
And plus, Brian. you know, Mongol is kind of a he's kind of a a two he's not a two bit player. Mm -hmm. But dark side, he's looking for things like the anti life equation. Yeah, yeah. He's more you know, dynamic. I mean, he's he's he, he is a god. He's, he's more and, like Thanos. If yeah, you wanted to he's draw more like comparison. Thanos. So these, yeah, it's, it's probably apocryphal. But what people always sort of say is that Mongol is kind of a Thanos ripoff, and Thanos, although an original idea, was also kind of a dark side ripoff. So mm -hmm. it's just a cycle of people being similar right. to each other. Yeah, for sure. And and Kirby was just like he 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 brought forth dark side to make the opposite of Odin because he was like, I'm creating my new gods. I'm mm -hmm. done with doing Thor. I'm doing my new stuff. So. And he was like, that's, Whoop, DC. Yeah, hope that's a good answer for you. Let's move <laughs> on. David Stevens asks, how do you think the time and soul stones will be woven into the MCU given the future movies? Well, we talked about this with Doctor Strange. I think the time gem will be the Eye of Agamotto and the soul gem will be somehow embedded maybe in Warlock or in a cocoon of some kind, but it'll be, re it'll be revealed and released somewhere in Guardians of the Galaxy too is my guess. What do you guys think? Weird, Soul Gem makes more sense in a Doctor Strange movie for me than time powers, but your argument for what they would do with the Soul Gem in Guardians <clears> 2 <throat> is so compelling. I was going to say exactly that. I mean, the time gem seems more like a Guardian sci-fi sci conceit as the soul deals with what Doctor Strange really is mm. and gets to the heart of, of all that. But you never know. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I'd like to think that Howard the Duck <laughs> is hanging on to one of the one of the gems right on well, you know yeah, after kidding. it was the collector had it now his place has been trashed and howard the duck just randomly picked up some shiny object not knowing what it was and it very well sauntered off with it, it could be the soul gem for dr strange if that helps him do his astral projections it's hard to tell but there it's one of those is going to be in dr strange right and we don't know which one but i i'm sure we'll find out very soon um Let's go on to the next question. Ryan asks, do you think the X-Men franchise is underappreciated compared to other comic book film franchises? What do you think? <clears throat> I don't think so. I think people love the X-Men movies. I mean, I, I, they just, they're not tied into anything larger. Right. Like when you're talking about the MCU and you have the Avengers, but you've got your standalone <clears throat> movies, they haven't really done that with the X-Men. The X-Men movies were the beginning they were really the beginning of the, our modern superhero film cycle. Right. That Brian's, element of them, I think, probably is underappreciated. Uh, yeah, but absolutely. And when, I made fun of black leather versions of things, but the black leather version of the X-Men is the reason we have the superhero movies. Absolutely. Right. And then remember, the Ultimates universe sort of came out of what was happening in the X-Men comics. Most definitely. They were mimicking that. Yeah, and uh, the X-Men movies. And I, I think that um, you know when they come out, Days of Future Past was far and away the most successful x-men film i could see apocalypse if it's good i've heard it i've heard it actually is good oh, oh very good well and, uh, I, I think the the series as a whole if you look at like i guess x-men apocalypse is the sixth film of the x-men franchise but unfortunately they had a lot of misses with their wolverine spinoffs i think right. they were so the un, uneven the third movie is coming I guess that'll be Hugh Jackman's last film, but you know, I mean, X Men Origins. I meant X Men Three, sorry. Oh yeah, well, I mean, X Men: The Last Stand was also, you know, the less said about it, the better. You know, it's you know definitely the weakest of all of the X Men films. Well, it's also borderline offensive. You know, when Magneto is letting he goes, he he lets his shock troops go in and doesn't care about them. Right. You know, they're pawns. Yes. And, and and I was like, what? And then he stops loving Mystique when she Horrible. loses her power. That was the worst thing yeah. ever. And that would have never happened. Never I mean, it's happened. A, so there are a lot of strange missteps because the creative force, the creative direction of the first two films skimped off to do the, the boring-ass Superman film when he should have stuck around to do X-Men 3. I still love Brian Singer, but I hate Superman Returns. Um that because it also ruined X Men Three for me, so I got two bad superhero films because he scrimped off to do that one. So it's like, with the best intentions, I'm sure it just it's you know a leaden film with nothing happens. Yeah, but he came back and Brian produced First Class and then he directed Days of Future I, Past and Apocalypse. Yes, I'm very happy he came back, and I'm very happy. I loved First Class, yeah. directed by Matthew Vaughn. I thought it was a it was a great return to what the possibilities of the X Men could be. And with Days of Future Past, it was the return of Brian Singer. It was like, you know, I mean, he had a bunch of missteps. Jack the Giant Killer. There was a lot of weird films for him. I feel that just were not hitting any kind of right mark. I don't know if, where he was mentally when he was making the films. If he was just like collecting checks or whatnot. But him hitting all cylinders with Days of Future Past. You know, I love that film. So with that film, I feel like he, you know, he returned the X Men to what it should be. And I think, look, I might. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. I, I think Apocalypse. I'm more excited for X Men Apocalypse than any, because I started reading. You know, the movie set in 1983, which is actually when 
Storm's mohawk was introduced in wow. October of 83. And like X Men 173, I think. Mm -hmm. And I love the fact that they are doing that. I love that it's going to be a, when I grew up, the X Men, it's going to be my. I was I graduated from high school in the '80s. I'm going to see my X Men if I went to high school with them. Paul's X Men, you know, and I get it. I can't wait. I, yeah. I can't wait. I mean, it's set in the same year as the movie Valley Girl. It's I'm very and risky yeah. business I, I and that, Rumble yeah. Fish. I, I guess the thing for me that makes it easy to underappreciate the X Men movies, even though I love them, is that the sort of ambition of it has been inconsistent. Um, and That's even because like X Men and X Men Two, there was a build there. The yeah. same kind of sort of. Uh, epic build that we look for in the MCU now and in the like DC TV universe um, but then when 3 didn't go so well like since then there's it f has felt at times as if it's like like one of those stories you write where you write the first part and you fold it over and you hand it to the next person and you just sort of right. see and like you can have a bunch of interesting elements but even First Class which I loved was just kind of a lot of throwing things at the wall mm -hmm. like Havoc was in the X-Men before Cyclops it didn't matter at the time because we were like just please make a good X-Men movie right. and they did and that's great but it's sort of the thing that is sometimes missing from it is the same sense of like the really well thought out Kevin Feige has decided how everything should go and is mostly getting to have his way so we can enjoy the consistency of it. That's, that's a luxury that we have because of the success of the X-Men movies, but they've been kind of a victim of that because now they're sort of putting the pieces back together. Like, yeah. maybe you didn't mean to have Mystique be the main character, but she ended up as Jennifer Lawrence, and she's amazing, so now we're living in a universe where Mystique is the main character of X-Men, and I'm kind of okay with that. She's great, and they've right. done a wonderful job, but the sort of making it up as you go along doesn't play to the strengths of the X-Men being a giant opera. I like what you said because X-Men 1 and 2 were so perfect. One, and then the second one even better. It was like like some sequels are so much better than the first film, and then it, the floppy, weird, strange, horrible third film, which doesn't deliver on anything that the first two films did, because the heart well, of it left sort and of was going to go phoenixy, but they, that's they not what it ruined like. Dark Phoenix. They ruined so many plot lines in one film. It's like how many plot lines can you destroy in one movie? Well, Last Stand is almost tied with X Men Origin, or Wolverine Origins, where horrible introduction and destruction of Deadpool, horrible storyline of Wolverine with like young baby mutants and a weird CG Professor X at the end. I mean. That movie is an abomination. I mean, it's made with the best intents to make a blockbuster film, but just horrible. So it's like, you have so many of these like uneven films mixed in with the X-Men. Well, okay, as much as we all have this love for Deadpool already, you've got Colossus in Deadpool, which is, he's, he's, a, he's a core member of the new X-Men team when they mm -hmm. were introduced. And Peter Rasputin is a huge part of the X-Men mythology. Weird and now way to go. It <laughs> is a weird, so now Deadpool is in the same universe <clears throat> as X-Men Apocalypse, right. as how is that gonna work? Like, and I haven't asked Brian about this, I don't know, did he consult? I have no idea. I mean, that's yeah. gonna be a really weird thing. Like, or what how, about Gambit? Yeah, is, yeah. It, so Deadpool's the beginning of the, of the X-Men universe now? Supposedly. I mean, that's some crazy it's stuff. It's pretty weird, but it's kind of cool that they're introducing Colossus and uh, right. Negasonic Teenage <laughs> Warhead like in the Deadpool movie as like, side characters that are going to be played kind of for humor in a certain sense. This I'm excited I'm not, about I'm not it. sure I'm going to get my art-loving, borderline pacifist Colossus in the Deadpool movie. You, I don't that's, quite know. You're not going to get that. I don't it's see that. It's a little sad. Yeah, yeah it's... Uh, it's that's what... Whose sister's magic? Yes, right. Rihanna. He's you know who I love. Yeah. I mean, are they gonna? It's gonna be really yeah. interesting to see if Fox had a Kevin Feige, which I don't think they do. I think Brian's close to that, right. but I don't think Brian is particularly interested in doing becoming the empresario over right. all mutants. But if they did, it would be interesting to see these people and spin off into the new mutants. If they had somebody the in charge, they would already have New Mutants and X Force in production. Right, right now right. with ecstatic i mean come on there are so many incredible stories already written and done and designed by artists sitting that fox owns well, the origin that they of could cable have you know you, one could, of these. you could do the origin of cable you could get james marsden and you could get famke johnson to come play scott and gene and do that whole ascani son storyline mm. how great would that be, be you know you'd make a sci-fi epic with previously existing X-Men actors to anchor the whole thing and do the whole story of Cable. All right, we're going to have to have a secret Fox <laughs> meeting in the next couple weeks. We're going to talk to Rob Life about this. We're going to force these people into this. I so, don't mean to act like their job is easy. But I know, it's right? tough because like, I have loved yeah. the last couple of movies and I want them to be as great as the If any Fox right executives, are, they're looking at us going, Ascani, what are you what, even talking what, what about? Does he, what, is, what is a cable? Is he talking I, I, about the cable cord, cord cutting no cable? <laughs> Listen, we'll, we'll school you. Ascani's son, that would be a great... 
that would be a great movie. You get James Marsden and, and Fomke Johnson to come back to anchor your film. They're your stars. You don't have to pay them a lot. Bring them back to play Scott and Gene and do the whole origin of Cable. That whole story was awesome. I would, I would be watching that. I would be too. Hey, it's a sweaty question of the week. It's by Jack Healy. It's a quick poll. Better opening line of a movie. This will begin to make things right. Or nerds, geeks, sweaties. So... Nerds, Geek, Sweaties is my film, The Death Superman Lives, What Happened, which I thought was fun that this guy mentioned it with This Will Begin to Make Things Right, which is the very first line of Star Wars The Force Awakens. Spoilers! Um, <laughs> said by Max von Cito. But a lot of people have said that that first line is in reference to all of the prequels. So if you, like me, hated the three prequel films, even though I had to just watch them all again to do our commentary tracks, which was literally painful and hurt mm. my brain. Um, this will begin to make things right, I think is a very subtle, maybe not too subtle, little, hey, check this film out. This is gonna, if you didn't like those prequels and found them to be strangely wooden and boring, um, it's filled with a lot of scenes of people talking um, and not, no, no real, it was just exposition and not showing, which is like the, what, hey, it's a movie. Um, so, or my line, which ones do you guys, who do you prefer? <laughs> what keeps me on the show? Hey, any, either one. It doesn't matter. It was just a fun question. You know, yeah, different movies, different purposes. Yeah. I'm going to take the cheat. I would say, I, I'm going to say, I think that the first line of a movie should be about that movie. The first line of a movie should not be referencing another movie. So in the case of these two lines, mm -hmm. your line was better. All right. Because this will begin to make things right. You know what that is? That is a slap in the face of George Lucas himself. Whether you like the, the sequels or the prequels or not, he did give us Star Wars. He did give us Empire. He did give us Jedi. What? There's been too much George Lucas hatred in the world. That's true, but it did work as a line in context. It well, it did. It was, it was subtle, but I'll say this about George Lucas. I don't hate George Lucas. I think he's a genius. I loved American Graffiti. I loved THX 1138. I still watch it. At least once every two years I watch that film. I think it's great. I love dystopian science fiction future films. And I especially love filmmakers who are not afraid to give me a, an unhappy ending. Because life just ends. And also stories don't just, you know, stories continue on forever. They don't just wrap up at a tiny bow. It's like a story. You don't know how it's going to end. It doesn't always have to end with some kind of, you know, fulfilling climax. George know? Lucas has done more for the art of cinema over the last 40 years than arguably anyone. Oh, the more, advances yeah. that ILM has, have made, which led to what James Cameron was able to sure, do. A little thing called the edit droid, which then became Avid, which is what nonlinear digital filmmaking is all based on, which also revolutionized everything that Photoshop. we all use. Photoshop, Photoshop all the created. things that are on our iPhones that were like, oh, what's an iCinema and all that stuff. None of it would have been possible without the ability to transform media from a thing which was tape into this digital retro recreation device. And we which have is, Pixar because we had Lasseter from ILM, right? Yep. Yeah. So Pixar. yeah, we owe, Lucas Arts made all the best adventure games in the 90s. THX so. sound systems, all these different kinds of sound advances are all due to George investing his time and money that he made from the toys of Star Wars into cinematic and media. Also, let's not forget that he brought Kurosawa's movies yep. to uh, the United States, like Kagamusha. He, him and Coppola brought mm -hmm. that over. I think it was Kagamusha. Yep, Kagamusha. Yeah, and, and uh, all that he's done for world cinema, making people aware of things. I mean, he just gave $10 million to USC for minority students. He's also a co-creator of Raiders of the Lost Ark and the entire Indiana Jones franchise. So, I mean, it's easy to poo-poo George Lucas because he made a couple of bad prequels, you know? It's like, he was like, look, I want to tell my story. Like, everyone was like, okay. We all know he sat, surrounded himself with too many yes men. It's his money. I'm doing what I want. That's kind of the, you know, and he did it. And it just, you know, Jar Jar, he's going to be the main focus of the, we've seen the behind the scenes stuff. And like everything hinges on Jar Jar. Well, it didn't work out, you know? So it turns out everything did. Hinge yeah. On. So, I mean, I thought it was droids using binoculars. Wouldn't I, you just have droids? Like, why do they even need to see? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so, yeah, you're right. George Lucas bashing. Uh, none of us are doing that. All I'm saying with, especially with The Force Awakens, was that even though it was against what he wanted, because he was like, I don't like the retro thing, I've always tried to do, my trilogies were all new, like the prequels it was a different time, all the vehicles are different. He would have done something like all these new, these new three Star Wars movies, if Lucas was doing them, 
everything would look different. You wouldn't have X-Wings, you wouldn't have TIE Fighters, you wouldn't have Star Destroyers. The only things that would be a constant are R2-D2 and C-3PO, and everything else would be different because that's the kind of story he would want to tell. I understand where the Disney group went, where JJ went, is like they wanted to get back to what's made Star Wars so endearing and the, the, they're hitting that nostalgia, but they're also bringing back that flavor, which some would argue, you know, we won't talk about, you know, details about it, good or bad, what they did with the film. Um, anyway, you should see Star Wars Force Awakens. <laughs> I know it's not a superhero film, but if you haven't seen it already, please, my God, see I don't know. I, I think comics. Daisy no, Ridley's topic. character, Daisy Ridley's character is kind of a superhero. You're right. She has all kinds of powers. She, she can she can do anything that is put in front of her. She can apparently fly the Millennium Falcon better than oh spoilers. Yeah. So she's a superheroine. Yeah. I would, so yeah. are I would the not, other characters of the movie who yeah. have superpowers. Yeah, I would not argue that Star Wars doesn't have superheroes in it. So definitely check that film out. This that's it for us. That you've been watching episode number thirty nine, the very first episode of two thousand sixteen. I'd like to thank our special guest, Robert Meyer Burnett. Where can people find you online? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at rm burnett. You can find me at Twitter at burnett rm, or find me on Facebook at Robert Meyer Burnett. And Amy Dallin, thank you again for being on the show. Where can people thank find you? Thank so you so much for having me back. Uh, I am on Twitter at enthusiamy. Uh, I also have my own YouTube channel, and you can find me on Geek and Sundry, doing all kinds of different stuff. Right on. And you can find me. Just follow me on John Schnepp uh, at, on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. You get my film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened, by going to tdoslwh.com. Get the digital download and support some independent film. And we're going to watch a lot of superhero stuff. It's going to be all over the place. We're going to movies. We're going to be in the TV zone. We're going to be watching a lot of stuff. Buy some comics. Go and support your local comic book stores. And I'll see you guys next week. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.